everyone and we after jumping a lot of steps on our schedule we do the final event of the schedule well final but one still we have to do lunch so we don't know what time of the day lunch would be if it comes before we finish the lecture we will take a break and have lunch and come back and finish the lecture if it comes after the uh, lecture we'll we just wait and maybe just take uh, if it's possible to take home or we just eat and leave, okay? So as I was saying, this uh, part was more targeting the beginners to people who have never sat in a machine learning, data science, or um, artificial intelligence course. If you are a computer science major and you have done those, this might be a revision for you. But for uh, some of you who are new, this uh, give you an idea Especially, I thought when I, when when Anis was talking, I thought probably we should have had this course before, because they were using a lot of terms that might be new to you that you're not familiar with, right? So next time when we're doing this, probably we start with this course where we introduce people to the language that people use when they describe uh, these works they do in in data science and machine learning. Okay, so just remember in high science some of the things they were talking about when you come across these terms in this lecture, but also we will share the slides so you can always go back and look at their slides and go through their talk, okay? All right, so let's get started. Are the slides changing? Oh, I should click here. Okay, that would be the outline of our talk today. Oh, it's still loading. Um, I'll do an intro where we talk about machine learning uh, and related terms. Um, then I'll talk about uh, some of the paradigms or categories or types of machine learning. Some of them um, briefly, um, Anes has mentioned. Um, I'll mention some opportunities and some challenges. And actually, instead of doing a practical demo, we'll just uh, discuss some of the practical issues you will encounter when you try to build a machine learning model. And the idea is that um, there's, a, if, you, if you, you just Google, if you Google Indaba, deep learning Indaba, you would see the website. There are many, many tutorials there that you can take on your own. There are a lot of online material that you can read, you know, and practice. So this is just to whet your appetite so that you push yourself to go and look for these things and read, okay? So it's not possible to teach uh, uh, machine learning in one and a half hours or two hours, you know. So this is a whole semester course. So we are condensing a lot of stuff, okay? Just to entice you also to have a probably better understand some technical talks like the one we saw earlier when you understand some of this jargon that is used, okay? Okay, so again, we there are many uh, amazing stuff that are being done. We just saw some examples from agriculture and luckily, Anes listed a lot of work that is going on in this space using AI that probably he, like that he is not involved in, but they are going on sometimes sometimes in Africa, sometimes in other parts of the world. Okay, so I just give a few more examples that are not in agriculture, for instance, machine translation. This is a big thing. Uh, now everybody on your phone has Siri and Alexa, you know, all these things are using machine learning algorithms at the back, okay? Right. Okay. Um, another, I like a one, 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 one big highlight was in games also, you know. In games, machine learning, our artificial intelligence has shown to be very successful. And one of the most difficult games to play is AlphaGo, some kind of chess like a board game kind of thing. But um, it was, uh, you know, people in, in game theory are always interested in. Uh, developing algorithms that would win human players, you know, and they have not never been successful until this was in 2016, 2017, I think. Then uh, Google DeepMind in, in, in London built what is called AlphaGo, and AlphaGo played against the best uh, uh, AlphaGo champion, okay? The, the, algor the game is called AlphaGo. I think the, uh, the algorithm was called AlphaZero. But I'm confusing those two names, okay? But it was the first time an algorithm beat the best player 
world champion of AlphaGo, okay? And it uses very sophisticated algorithms, mostly deep learning type algorithms. So I'm gonna talk about that. But yes, in the, in the games front also, these algorithms are doing great. Another space that uh, these algorithms are being used is in self-driving cars, in autonomous vehicles. This is also a very big area that uh, the auto car industry is investing in. And there's a lot of work trying to build algorithms that would self-navigate, okay? Cars, if you put this on cars, the cars should be able to drive, all right? We are not saying like Westfield Junction, but in a very standard uh, traffic operation system, you would expect them to work. And in fact, they have been used in a couple of places in a couple of cities in the US, actually. I don't know if you know about Uber, which is this taxi kind of uh, service, you know, in most uh, European countries or Western countries, they have Uber, which is like a taxi, you can order it online and it will come and pick you. And the driver will take you to where you go. And the app is on your phone, right? You order from your phone. And then if you want, you pay them cash or the, you can pay by if you have your bank account attached to your account. Right? And the thing is, it has all this. Uh, it knows, it estimates how long it will take the driver to get to the place. So it's able to estimate the price of, of, of your trip for you, okay? So... Uber has tried using these kinds of vehicles where they are autonomous, there's no driver, the vehicle comes and stops in front of you, you get in and then the vehicle drives to your location, you know. Yeah, there have been one or two incidences where um, uh, it made an accident, but most of the time they haven't had any issues right now. And these technologies are just being improved over and over. In very uh, like uh, uh, controlled situations like in big hospitals where they need to deliver um, medication from one part of the hospital to another hospital, very, very big hospital. We're not talking about what we're talking about, like you have go, uh, what we have here. You talk about, let's say, the whole of Fajara being one big hospital, right, in, the, in, in, in other cities, right? So it's not easy to say we need to get uh, uh, messengers to deliver this from one place to another. So they have uh, auto automated car delivery systems, right, that are using AI. They can drive, drive, drive around the hospital very easily. Okay, and again, this is not a messy traffic condition, and we're thinking we're still a long way to go to use these kinds of technologies in our setting, unless we change the way we drive in this country. This might be difficult, but yeah, it's a challenge open to you guys. You might want to have to develop the technology. You develop either the system that we would have to be able to adopt this technology, or you develop uh, algorithms that are able to navigate our this system, our chaotic, seemingly chaotic system. Okay. So the challenge is for you. The other place where um, um, AI might be very, very impactful because it affects all of us, it's health, okay? I'm just giving an example of where health here is used to detect early type of breast cancer, where even, even, even the doctors couldn't detect this at this level. This was a group at MIT or Harvard that developed this algorithm, and they were detecting breast cancer as a much earlier stage than the doctor would detect, you know? And it's using an AI algorithm. So there are many, many successes of AI, and this is the way to go uh, uh, going forward. We, if any any society doesn't embrace AI, you'll be left behind, no doubt about it. Okay. So therefore, what is AI? Let's talk about it and get introduced to it. Um, so. Um, the whole thing was to, develop, to, 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 to talk about machine learning, but again, where machine learning is coming from a branch of computer science known as artificial intelligence, okay? So what is machine learning? Machine learning is just uh, algorithms that uh, try to behave, try to do tasks that humans can do, right? So you build algorithms that try to do what humans can do, okay? And in a sense, it's, you, you want them to have intelligence. This is why it's called um, uh, artificial intelligence, right? Um, there are debates on how far this can go and are they going to be really intelligent? Is it really intelligence we're talking about? But we are not worried about that. But the idea here is that the machine are able to perform tasks that humans can do, that they can see, like humans can see. Uh, this is this whole area of computer science that is come, that is uh, involved with machines being able to see is called computer vision, okay? The machine is able to see like a human. It is able to read like a human is able to read. It is able to 
give a speech like a human is able to give a speech or is able to write a speech you know so these are giving it abilities to do tasks that humans do okay so and typically you can model this as you know uh, action reaction kind of things you know you have uh, these machines are kind of sense sensor sensor systems okay and you give them certain actions uh, or they, they interact with the environment through certain actions and they can have certain responses that's all about intelligence to be able to respond to an environment okay so like i said ai is this field in computer science trying to build intelligent systems and we can categorize this in many ways um, one way is to think about ai in terms of the scope there's a narrow ai there is general ai and there's super intelligence okay um, narrow ai is where you are building this ai system that are able to do individual tasks that humans can do like seeing like speaking like smelling and things like that these are individual tasks that we do but if the human being can combine all this in a very sophisticated way if you want the machine to do this this is going to be what is what is referred to as general or strong ai okay so the weak ai is where we do we break down the task individually and we get our machines to do this as much as possible or our agents or intelligence systems to do these tasks individually okay but we can build we the goal of a lot of these uh, technology companies like google deep mind and others is how do we combine we know we have got to a place where our weak ai is very good now you know like we have uh, uh, we have these uh, uh, models that you can build that can detect breast cancer better than humans right now okay but how do we combine different tasks effectively like humans do for this uh, this is the next frontier of machine learning this is where we are pushing okay and this is what is referred to general ai okay or strong ai but also there are people in the community who believe actually we might be able to build intelligent systems that are more intelligent than humans okay beyond the humans okay this is what is very what is referred to as super intelligence okay so weak ai general ai or strong ai and super intelligence and there is a lot of debate around super intelligence the, the community is split there are people who believe that this might be possible and there are people who believe this is not possible um there are people on the fence uh so yes and we are not going to be worried maybe you guys will find answers to that okay but the other way you want to categorize machine learning um, ai is uh, uh okay you're saying that clearly is in terms of either machine learning or expert systems and i think uh Anis alluded to this right in the machine learning you don't program the instruction that the machine should follow okay you don't tell it to get to that door you have to avoid hitting an obstacle and you have to bend this or do that you have, you have to put all those instructions down if you are building an expert system okay so there was artificial intelligence before machine learning you know um you would go to you would for instance talk to a machine on the phone you call this uh, helping agents on the phone you call them they ask you your, your name you give your number they try to locate you and all that because all this is programmed if uh, this this is the person's name or if this is the, like for instance in the banking system they want to help you, you troubleshoot the problem you call they say enter the last four digits of your credit card for instance you enter that last digit of your credit card it is able to mark that to a database and it can pull out your your, your instruction but this is all explicitly programmed okay so this is an expert system it's an intelligent system but it's an expert system the expert is like transferring the expert's knowledge to this system where the expert programs exactly how he would do the things and he would want the machine to do those things that way okay that's an expert system so you give all the instructions all the steps that the machine should follow but there is a way that is different which is the machine learning system well no you want to give it examples of how to do things okay you don't you don't tell the machine this is the way to do things you give it examples of how to do things okay you give it examples of images that have breast cancer and images that don't have breast cancer okay it will learn some kind of a map between images that have breast cancer and their labels that says they have breast cancer 
or images that don't have breast cancer, and there are labels that say that they don't have breast cancer. So you have inputs, therefore, these, these images, you can think of this as inputs, but also you have labels to say, to give the correct example and the wrong example. Because if you teach somebody to learn something, this is the way we learn uh, when we were young. When you give an example, you know, your teacher, you give an example, you should give a counter example to know that, okay, this is the way this is done, but or if you wanna say, this is a bottle, you must tell the person what is not a bottle, because otherwise they might go think, oh, this is also a bottle. No, so you so you have to give a counter example. So the machine should learn what is a bottle from what what is not a bottle. Okay, so you should give examples and counter examples. So the machine then learns. So this is what I call the X and the Y here. Okay, the X is the actual images or the input that you give, and the Y is the label to say yes, it is this category or the other category, or it could be something else like it could be. Um, ages of people you are trying to predict and so on, you know. So, but this is what we call uh, machine learning. You give this as an input, this pair of, 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 of input and uh, input data and label, and then you train a machine learning algorithms where the machine learning, learning now try to distinguish between the what is a particular class or another class, or it's try to predict somebody's age or somebody's uh, location, depending on what kind of problem you're working on. But the idea is when you do the training, the training outputs a model, okay? A model is some kind of function. When you give it the input data, it should be able to give you an, the correct output, okay? So if you, if you train this model and you have this input, uh, the, this, the, uh, this model as an output of, of your training, what you wanna do is if, for instance, in the breast, the breast cancer case, if you give it an image that has breast cancer, the machine should then the model should say this is a breast cancer image or no breast cancer image, and uh, it's also good to say like uh, Anna said to say at what certainty is the machine saying this is a breast cancer or not breast cancer, and this is usually done by probability. You say it would say this is breast cancer with 90% probability or with 50% probability. You know, so it would be de uh, depend. It would it will depend on the user now. To say if the model tells me it is confident 90 percent confident then i take that as a correct level if it tells me it's 50 percent i say this is a random chance so this might be wrong okay so 50 percent is random you don't want to take that you want this is why you hear in the earlier speeches people talk about 90 percent accuracy you know so do you want to say if it this this is kind of uh, a way to say how confident your algorithm is in telling you in in, in a particular output okay so that's, that's uh, uh, I think I'm spending a lot of time because I'm gonna repeat all this later. Actually, there's another uh, one, which is also, you can consider it's, machine, it's also machine learning, but it has also a big community around it. Um, and they call it this reinforcement learning. It's also machine learning, but it, it's not the typical supervised machine learning or unsupervised machine learning that we will talk about later because you only have input data X. But also, it, it's kind of a reward system. It's, it's, it's coming from this idea of games, you know? So you, uh, 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 this uh, philosophy of, of learning that says that, you know, people learn when you give them rewards. You know, we all do this implicitly, right? When we, uh, our kids at home, they do good things, we give them reward, we say thank you, we, 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 we applaud them, right? Or we give them a little present, then they know they should behave this way, okay? When they do something wrong, we punish them. In the olden days, they whoop you now. Now we will say, okay, no, we are gonna, uh, like, uh, you are, you're not gonna watch TV or we take your tablet or something like that. So you punish the kid and they know that they should not repeat that kind of behavior, right? So that's the idea here, you know? You train an algorithm by giving it rewards, okay? And if it makes a if it makes a right move, you reward it. If you make a wrong move, you kind of punish it. Okay. So this is a reward system kind of thing. Again, the idea is let's say if you're training a robot to navigate this room, then you if it hits an obstacle, then it should get a negative reward. If it avoids an obstacle, it gets a positive reward. And all of it boils down to some kind of an objective function you are trying to maximize in in, in the whole problem. Okay and then you would give this reward as numbers, okay? So as, as the robot is, is getting better and better, these objective functions get more, uh, larger and larger, okay? But that's the whole idea. All right, let's move on. But what is data science? Why is data science in all this I'm talking about? Um, sorry, it's loading. 
So data science is a multidisciplinary blend of data inference, algorithms development, and technology in order to solve analytically complex problems. So if you're coming from statistics, all we do, a lot of the things we do in statistics is about inference, right? You know, we try to infer something from the data that we have, okay? Inference. This is also done in data science. But it's, um, it's a more focus on algorithm development than statistics would do. In statistics, usually we are not obsessed about the algorithm. We are obsessed about the ability to do the inference, right? And there are many traditional classical methods with fully grounded mathematics that support these things that we use, okay? But in data science, we are very, very interested in developing algorithms because we want to solve these problems that are super complex and typically we will not be able to solve by hand. Okay, so algorithm development and optim ultimately we want to develop a technology around these algorithms, okay, because we want to really solve a real life problem, okay. So there's a whole spectrum, okay, from um, data inference that would be have a lot of statistics and mathematics, for instance, going all the way to the technology development, okay. So it spans the whole spectrum. And you can see therefore this overlaps uh, with, uh, with AI significantly. AI does all that, right. Uh, so, so data science, um, uh, there, I took many definitions. Um, uh, this one I took from uh, Frank Lowe. He used to have a blog called Data Post, okay? Um, you could also think of data science as this inter interdisciplinary field, but processes and system to extract knowledge and insights from large data, uh, from large data sets or from large volumes of data, okay? Um, the algorithms that we develop in data science actually are mostly machine learning algorithms. I, like, I, like I hinted earlier, you have artificial intelligence and the core, one core aspect of artificial intelligence is machine learning, right? You know, if you, if you split artificial intelligence in, in terms of algorithms, you have the machine learning algorithms and you have the AI, the expert systems, right? But the, uh, Contemporary or, or, or currently, when we think about data science, the core algorithms of data science are these machine learning algorithms, okay? There are classical, traditional statistical algorithms that we use that are also considered data science that might not be machine learning at all, you know? There are other methods like uh, um, understanding, for instance, uh, network systems, you know, complex network science kind of related system that you would consider data science, but not machine learning, for instance. But all these fields are gradually just all blending because you can use different alg algorithms. There, you can use machine learning algorithms to do things that you never thought you could do before. So the boundary is being very broad right now. Okay, but as far as our community is concerned, um, we interchangeably use these terms: artificial intelligence, data science, machine learning. We were kind of referring to the same thing. Okay. Uh, in a hand wavy way, okay. So, but but uh, the main intersection of machine learning and data, uh, artificial intelligence and data science is 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 is, is machine learning, okay. And again, you could uh, take it that data science have a significant overlap with statistics, and you go to certain universities. Actually, data science is part of the stats department. You know, they think they own data science, so they are in a fight with the computer science department that want to own data science. You know. So yes, we are not going to go into that talk here, but yes, okay. Before data science, there was this big hype called big data. Now you don't hear it much, you know, but before there was uh, like, when I, the time I was doing my PhD, this was time people were talking about big data in those days, you know. So still, still conceptually what it means is that this, this, the huge amount of data that we in our times are faced with, you know, you know, like social media data that we generate every day, how many tons of pictures we put on our Instagram and how many tweets we make and all that. This is generating tons of data, but not only that, even in real problem solving systems, like in our health system, we have developed machines that are able to take high resolution images now. These images are huge data set. They generate huge data sets, you know. You have in security system, they have CCTV cameras that are capturing all these images. In the imaging of the sky, in in, uh, in in astronomy or cosmology, these people are interested in imaging the sky. They have developed techniques where they're taking these huge images. In fact, their images are so huge that they cannot store the images. They don't have the storage to store these images. They have to analyze these images on the fly, okay? 
So this is the time we found ourselves. There is big data, okay? There's huge volumes of data that are difficult to handle. And therefore, this is the right time. Actually, machine learning is here to help us handle this big data, okay? So this is data that poses challenges in this analysis, um, capture, uh, data curation, and all these techniques that we need because the data is not the standard data that we are used to dealing with, okay? So it has different characteristics, a lot of Vs, okay? In fact, these Vs has increased. When this started, there was three Vs. Uh, now I am putting four here, but I'm, I guess if you just Google big data, the Vs of big data, you would find more Vs than this, okay? But the nature of this data is the volume is huge, okay? So that's the fourth V. It has huge volume, okay? And it has high velocity, okay? The rate at which this data is captured is high. Okay, so the rate at which we upload images on the internet is just too fast to be analyzed by standard algorithms. Okay, not to talk about the imaging problem that I talked about in, in, in astronomy, for instance. So the velocity, the rate at which we're capturing this data is high. Just imagine a, 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 a driverless car driving down the street. It has to process images of everything around it. Okay, sound of everything around it because it's not only images. You want to figure somebody is talking, or is, is a police siren coming, or is an ambulance coming behind me. So it's all that information is processing at a very high velocity. Okay, so speed is, is uh, velocity is one of the characteristics of big data, and there's veracity. Okay, what did it say? It's veracity there. Now I should use glasses. Now I'm not sure I'm going to see. Oh, variety. Yes, variety. Variety uh, just means it has different forms, right? It comes in different forms, right? We can have audio audio data, we can have image data, we can have text data, and usually you combine all that. For instance, if the car is driving, it has to process all that because a stop sign is there, it says stop. You should be able to read a stop sign and know this is a stop sign, okay? If it's an arrow that says you cannot turn, you usually see this curved arrow with a bar on it to say you cannot turn. You should be able to process that image and know that it cannot turn left, for instance, or it cannot turn right. So different kinds of uh, data, uh, uh, types of data. And then veracity, this could mean the sizes can be different, you know. You know, some data has uh, um, require different small memory, some come in huge, yeah, large quantities. How do you handle these kinds of data, okay? So yeah, so if you hear about data, historically we used to talk about it, this is what it means, okay? And I just added, uh, so there's an example here, actually. So you have this volume, it is, too, it is too much data that we get. So think about these data points, too many of them, and they are coming at a very high velocity to us. And they have a lot of variety, okay? And they have veracity. Actually, veracity is about the uncertainty about the data. They may have a lot of noise when you measure this data, okay? So this is, you can see those... Uh, uh, kind of circular stuff, uh, uh, like shady stuff around. This is just telling you that actually this point might lie anywhere there. So you might be mess capturing this point with an error, okay? How do you handle this, okay? So big data comes with this, uh, with this issue, okay? The problem of uncertainty in the data, okay? All right, I think that was a quick one on, on data science and big data. Now let's look at machine learning. And I do a formal definition. Um, so again, this is motivated. Uh, uh, the interesting thing about machine learning and AI is that don't think of it as us computer scientists or statisticians uh, or mathematicians who are interested in this problem. No, there's a huge community that are in the neurosciences who want to understand how we learn as humans and some of these ideas are coming from there learning as a problem there's a huge community in education who are interested in how we learn how do we what's the best way to teach people to learn things okay so there are a lot of ideas that are fertilize, cross fertilizing so this is why this is what makes data science artificial intelligence a very interdisciplinary area the very interdisciplinary space so People have been wondering, how do we define learning? What is learning? And if we know what learning is as humans, then we should be able to transport that to machines, okay? So learning is any process, uh, according to, this was web, 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 
or who else? How about Simon? I think you should, if you Google it up, you will find that. So learning is any process by which a system improves performance from experience. Okay, this is like the formal definition of learning. This is what uh, you would learn in a typical machine learning uh, computer science course. Okay. It concerns machine learning, therefore, concerns with computer programs that automatically improve their performance based on experience. Okay. So if you build uh, uh, a program or an algorithm that should be able to classify whether your email is a spam email or no spam email. This was a big thing in the earlier days now. It's no longer because they are so perfect now. You don't even get junk mail anymore because they built in all these spam filters that do this for you. But before when email just started, you get bombarded with a lot of spam email. You know, your, your inbox gets so full. You worry, you keep deleting emails a lot, you know. But now, and but now these things have been improved so much, you know, that you you once in a while you get one spam or two spam emails, okay? But again, assuming yeah, and actually this is what happened is you want to build a model that is able to uh, detect that this is a spam e email and it's going to automatically put it in your junk folder, and versus this is not a spam email. So these are not perfect. This is why sometimes you would even have a good good email that comes to you that is mistakenly put in this junk folder. So once in a while, it's a good practice just to check your junk folder, especially if somebody said to you, we sent you an email and you did not respond. It might be in your junk folder, okay? Because the algorithm has decided that that was very close to the type of junk email it has been seeing, okay? But the idea is if you expose this algorithm to more and more junk emails and non-junk emails, it should get better and better and better, okay? And then that, therefore it is learning. When this thing happens, then learning is taking place, okay? That's the whole point. Oh, I'm able to make this bigger. Let me see. Oh, yeah, good. Now I can be able to read stuff from here. So Arthur Samuel, um, one of the gurus in computer science, I guess computer scientists will know about him. Define machine learning as a field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. Again, uh, this is very baffling for people if you hear this for the first time, because you think, well, when you're training this model, you must definitely program something. Yes, you are programming them to learn, but you are not programming them, you are not programming the, what you expect them to learn. You don't program them uh, the instructions, okay? That would tell them this is how a, an image that has uh, cancer looks from an image that doesn't have cancer. You don't program that to look for, okay, look for a particular spot. When this spot is here, then it has cancer. No, you don't do that. So you don't give explicit instructions. So that's what is he's referring to here as they are not being explicitly programmed, okay? You just expose the data to them and they learn from the data what is a cancer image and a non -cancer, what is a non-cancer image, okay? So this is the difference, okay? So for example, when a computer uh, learns how to play checkers or play uh, Alpha AlphaGo, okay? I, I think I'm very slow. I'm gonna skip this uh, exercise here. I, I had a small exercise that I wanted us to uh, try, but I think we're going very slow and um, there's no sign of launch, unfortunately. We should proceed. Um, so why why now why is it, why now there is uh, this big success in machine learning these ideas were there and if you look at uh, the literature in this in the early 40s you know 1940s there were papers about neural networks you know which is which i haven't talked about yet but i'm going to talk about you know this is actually the bedrock of most of the successes of machine learning and data uh, and, and, and and data science currently okay number one in those days when those ideas were developed they don't have enough data to train this thing on. Number two, they don't have enough computing power to be able to train this in those days, okay? So the good thing, the two mixes, mix, mix that make this thing work for us, uh, uh, make us the lucky generation that uh, is able to uh, exploit these methods is that we are the generation that we're generating all this data. We, have, we, we also have computer, luckily, there's a lot of success done in building uh, computers with huge computational power, huge storage you know and after actually we are able to build 
better and better algorithms. I think uh, Ares also showed you this list, uh, this slide where he had TensorFlow and all these other technologies. These are algorithm platforms that uh, make these computations go very fast and efficient. Okay, this is only done now. In those days, it was not possible to do this. Okay, although there were smart people who understood that this could work, it could do good things, but they didn't have the tools to, to, to implement it. They didn't have the data to train it on. Okay, so the three main reasons are this: the data, the computational power, and the algorithms that we we have currently. Okay. All right. Then we talk about briefly the different types of machine learning paradigms or machine learning categories. And in fact, the list can go on, okay? I just stated this, a supervised learning, unsupervised learning, semi-supervised learning, reinforcement learning, deep learning, online learning, different kinds of learning that you will see, okay? All of them mean different things also. They mean they, they are all interrelated somehow, okay? So this is just to uh, showcase a few of them for you. You can look up more if you're interested. But traditionally, these are the three key ones, you know. Supervised learning, I mentioned earlier, uh, actually what I, most of the thing, example I was giving were supervised learning, where the idea is to build a model that is able to predict something. Therefore, you should be, you know, it's able to tell whether an image, for, for example, is able to tell whether an image is cancerous or not cancerous. So therefore, you must have an image that you have identified as cancerous. So that means you have a label for that image, okay? So the data must be labeled, okay? So supervised learning is when the data is labeled, you're building this model that is using this labeled data, okay? On supervised learning, there's, there are no labels for the data. For instance, you just wanna say, okay, you're given a bunch of images, you don't know which one has uh, uh, breast cancer, which one has breast cancer, but you maybe run, say, a clustering algorithm, okay? Where you cluster these images. When the, the algorithm will try to figure out what makes certain images similar than other images. So similar images might be grouped into one group and you may realize, okay, actually images that had cancer are put in one group and images that don't have cancer are in the other group, okay? So in that case, there are no levels. There were no, you, what you would do is you, then you take those sample images to a practitioner and let them look at them and say whether this, say they could categorize them as, as cancerous or non-cancerous, okay? But anyway, this area is what is referred to as uh, unsupervised learning, okay? There are no levels. I talked about reinforcement learning. Um, this is where I said um, you, you don't actually have labels like unsupervised learning, but you kind of have domain knowledge enough that you can give reward systems, okay? You can give reward to the model you are training. And the model's objective would be to optimize some objective function. And based on that, uh, uh, you, you build your reinforcement learning model. Actually, there's something that we would call semi-supervised learning, where you do a bit of supervised and unsupervised, okay? You may have uh, images that are partially labeled. Uh, the majority are not labeled. You run an, a clustering algorithm to, label, to, 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 to cluster the ones that are not labeled. This is unsupervised. But then you could say, okay, after that, I'm going to take my labeled one to inform me whether those clusters are correct clusters. If it takes your label ones and put them in the right in, in the right clusters, then you are doing a semi-supervised method. You are using both supervised and unsupervised. Okay. Um, I should have said this is a, um, a less formal uh, presentation. You should stop and ask questions, okay? This is like a, a class lecture, okay? So stop and ask, stop me and ask questions, okay? Don't 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 just be sitting there like that. Um, okay, again, this is slow to load. A bit of notation here. Just to formalize, you know, I'm talking about um, inputs and outputs or uh, input and labels. So think of the axis as your inputs. Um, and Y as your labels, and so D might be a data set, okay? And maybe you have M, M could be a million data images, for instance, okay? So we would refer to this input also as features. Typically that's the word that is used, features, but features have may have a different meaning also in statistics, okay? Then we have the labels, and again, what we try to do is this function F that takes your input and some parameter theta 
to predict your labels, okay? To predict your labels, you know? So that what you want to say is your label Y is equal to a function of X, uh, which is parameterized by theta. It might not be a perfect, so it might be exact equality. There might be some error, so therefore you you take you account for that error with that epsilon, okay? So all you do in supervised learning is to learn this map, this function that maps your input to your output, okay? So there are different types of supervised learning tasks. They can be categorized mainly into two, regression and classification, okay? Regression, normally you have the data is real valued and you are predicting a real value number, okay? Like if you are predicting somebody, you, collect, you can collect the heights of people here and we want to train a model that will predict uh, uh, people's height, okay? In that case, we are just doing a regression because we are going to predict a number, okay? We are doing a regression, okay? And there are many algorithms that are used to do this, um, linear regression, least squares, ridge regression, you know, and so on. Okay, and we can apply this to different kinds of application. I just mentioned this uh, demographic, demographic data kind of uh, forecasting or prediction, but you can focus weather, you can focus prices of houses, uh, power, uh, power output, and so on. Okay, anything that has a number that we can we can predict, a real number that we can predict, usually is a regression problem. Okay, and. The other one is classification. The classification, you would have a class now, okay? The, the, the most basic is two classes, you know, like I did, for example, I've been giving over and over to say, this cancer, this is cancer, or this is no cancer, okay? And again, since all these things have to be inputted on a computer, you have to give this a number, okay? You therefore encode, even if it's a categorical variable to say, uh, this is uh, cancer and this is no cancer, you wanna say, okay, I will give zero, to cancer and one to non-cancer, or I can do minus one and one, okay? But the computer needs the number to be able to compute stuff, okay? So you to input that, you have to convert those, those uh, uh, text values to numbers, okay? So it's important uh, that you're able to do this. So it's discrete value. If it's two class, you say binary classification, it could be more than two classes, with multiple classes, okay? You could say cancer, no cancer, or, or, or like, undecided or something like this, okay? If your algorithm, you can, can say those classes. Or oh, sometimes you, are, you wanna predict, uh, um, you have a, like excess x-rays, you wanna predict whether it was a pneumonia or it was TB or it was something else, you know? So it was more than two categories, okay? And the famous algorithms for this are logistic regression, support vector machines, knife base, and so on. And there are many applications I mentioned the email spam filter, the cancer I've been giving as an example. But there's also this character recognition. If you wanna read digits, this also has been a big challenge. Um, people are interested in reading digits, automatically reading of unwritten digits. And so this is this is, this falls in the area of character recognition. And you know, all, all digits are form, composed of nine basic digits, right? Zero to 10, sorry, zero to nine, okay? The rest is just combining this in different ways. So if the computer is able to read the zero to nine, then you, are, you should be able to read any number. So it's a classification problem. You, you take an image of the digit, you want the computer to classify as a zero or a one or a two or up to a nine, okay? So it's 10 classes in that case, okay? Okay. Quick question to see. Just my, just my You just have to be consistent. You just have to be consistent, okay? 
if you put if you give one for cancer you give two for non cancer this is also fine you have five different you have one it depends and if here all the images are either cancer or no cancer and no matter how many images you have the problem is two categories then you would have to use only two numbers consistently you, the ones that are cancer you all give them one number okay so if you put zero for cancer every image that has uh, uh, cancer the corresponding y value would be zero every image that doesn't have cancer if it's one then every image or the y value for that will be one Yes, because otherwise you cannot compute. Yeah. So Malik has a question. Thank you very much, Dr. My question is how do you handle imprecision? What? Imprecision. Imprecision. So we are we are banking on that experts have looked at the data and they correctly labeled them. Of course, even with that, there is a possibility of what you said. They, have, they could make mistakes. They could take a, a cancer image and mistakenly say it is not cancer. But also sometimes it's just not possible to decide. For reference, and they look at it and they are saying they are still not sure, right? You know. So all that you are thinking, what what uh, is 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 found out in practice is that it, most algorithm will accept if that is a small number of those kinds of faults. They would still algorithm you can and you have a large data set. The, the algorithm will still do well. Will not affect it too much. But if there are significant amount, then the algorithm will definitely not go, work well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful question. Now it's my turn to ask uh, questions. So, given uh, so, so, whether this is a classification or a regression problem, we are given idea about the size of houses in the real estate. Okay? So, half is developing the real estate, and he has two bedrooms, three bedrooms, and so on. Okay? So, you are given this, and uh, you are supposed to help them predict the prices for these houses, okay? They hire you as a data scientist, you go in there, they have all these sizes of their plots, and then they tell you, can you predict the model? They have example of prices, they have priced their houses before. Now they're building new houses, maybe new dimensions. Can you predict for them? Can you predict for them what the prices would be? Will that be a regression problem or a classification problem? A regression problem. Okay, good. You guys are following. Okay, predicting whether these houses will sell for more or less than the asking price, would that be considered uh, classification or regression? Classification, right? So what are the classes here? How many classes are there? Two classes, right? Yes. More or less, right? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Uh, I think, do I have another question? Yes. Actually, that was another one. Okay. Given a picture of a male, um, somebody's asking a question online. Okay. I will, I will. It says, to what extent do you know about Senegal's use of artificial intelligence and deep learning application to make its system more efficient in solving operational and complex issues than Gambia? And what would be the starting point for us in the Gambia? And how to make gains in the area? Not to be left behind. Okay, that's a very long question. Probably we should discuss this later. It's in the chat, right? It's in. The, you can see it on the chat, right? Okay. So Sally will come back to you. Let's do more our our thing. Where were we? We were here. So somebody shows you a picture of a male. My slides are fluctuating. Mm. Why is it on supervised now? 
predicting whether he is of high school, college, or graduate age. Somebody showed you a picture, and you want to look at the picture and tell whether that person is a high school student, or are they a college student, or they are at a graduate school. Is that a classification problem or a regression problem? Classification problem. How many classes are involved here? Three classes, right? Good. And if you have to predict this person's age on the basis of a given picture, what is that problem? Classification or regression? You are predicting the age of the person. You look at the image and you say whether they are 20 years or 25 years. It's a regression problem, right? Yeah. It's a regression problem. You're predicting a number. Okay, good. Seems you guys are following. All right, let's move a bit faster. Um, time is going. Um, so unsupervised learning is uh, a case I have mentioned earlier where the data is not labeled. The goal is to find some underlying pattern or structure in the data, okay? I give an example of clustering the data, for instance, to see probably whether the clustering algorithm can detect that like, one class is have certain features, that's why they are similar, and one class or a certain features, that's why they are similar. And ideally, we would want it to be one class is, if it's the images of the cancer, we say it tells us one class is cancer and one class is not cancer, okay? So, but there are no labels. That's the main difference between unsupervised and supervised learning, okay? Like I mentioned earlier, I'm not gonna go into detail. The algorithms uh, uh, that you would find in supervised learning are like clustering algorithms or association algorithms or dimensionality reduction kind of algorithm. You know, PCA, if you have done statistics, PCA is one kind of algorithm we use to do um, unsupervised learning. Clustering is very popular and it many uh, many different kinds of uh, clustering methods uh, that are being used, which is less popular probably is the association algorithms, but um, most people doing imagine computer science would have done a uh, course on, on these kinds of algorithms. They are not popular though in the machine learning area. Okay, I'm gonna skip those examples and move on to semi-supervised learning. Again, I think I did explain that quickly. Um, Semi-supervised is where you use both supervised and unsupervised, depending on the nature of your data. You may have some part of the data that is labeled and some part that is not labeled, okay? <clears throat> Normally what you wanna do is you improve, you have a supervised learning method, you, are, you don't have enough data, you wanna create, generate labels from the unsupervised one to improve the training of your algorithm, or you, the other way around, you did uh, unsupervised, you wanna be sure that uh, your algorithms are doing the right thing, you have correct labels, then you make sure, you try to see if your algorithm will predict where those uh, labels belong in, the, in, the, in your clusters, okay? So that is to improve performance of one algorithm or the other. And there are examples uh, uh, include uh, constraint, clustering, uh, semi-supervised uh, classification, and so on. Okay. Oh, good question. Somebody should be, you should be looking at the chat. Some people are asking questions there, apparently. Huh? Okay. What determines the use of classification method over the others? Okay. One classification method, yeah. Correct. He asked two questions. Okay, let me. I, I, okay, hang on a sec. I'm on full screen. I think you need to press escape, right? Okay, good. Okay, all right, that was a question. So Salu's question was, to what extent do you know about Senegal's use of artificial intelligence and deep learning applications to make the system more efficient in solving operational and complex issues than the Gambia? 
and what would be starting point for us in the Gambia and how to make gains. So I, well, I guess, uh, generally speaking, Senegal are ahead of us in a lot of areas, which is the front route, uh, Salio. Um, there is both government uh, investment in AI in that country, and there is also grassroots or private initiatives in that country that are way ahead of us. You know, um, I, I we were uh, unlucky today. Most of us couldn't join, but he was going to talk about his uh, new health platform that he's launching, where he's connecting doctors to patients online, and these doctors could be all over the world, and they're able to uh, diagnose patients using a lot of uh, a lot of um, natural language, NLP, and all kinds of uh, algorithms to be able to do this. But not only in Mustafa, there are a lot of other initiatives going on, you know. So I think in that regard, Senegal, they are bigger than us in terms of numbers. So what do you expect? So they are bigger than us in terms of numbers. So they are really ahead of us in terms of number of startups in the AI space, you know. Um, so and I, like I said, again, I think the awareness about AI and its potential it's more in their government than in ours, unfortunately. And they have policies and an and, and, and initiative that is pushing this very hard in, in, in their system. And the idea of some of our these gatherings is to generate the interest. Oh, this is why we invite politicians to this so that they know this is very important and we need to push this also to catch up. It is, there is no small country or large country. We can all benefit from this. We can all use this to leapfrog and catch up, you know, and make our systems work better, you know. There are certain problems we can definitely solve using AI and data science. Okay, Sally, I think that has, I hope that answers your question. Okay. And the question from uh, Karim says, what determines the use of one classification method over the other? Again, it depends on what you want to do. Uh, normally, what you actually would do, since uh, especially if the data set is not too huge, don't use one uh, classification algorithm, OK? Run a couple and see what the output is, OK? And compare, you know? Run them, maybe if, if possible, shuffle the data again, run again, shuffle the data many times, run, and then see which one is consistently performing better and stick on that one, okay? So that's that's the advice. Right? There's no strict rule. It's just a uh, like a rule of thumb, right? You know, it's just a practical way you want to solve this problem, okay? Sometimes it's not the most complicated one that does well, that does best, best okay? People um, are always like, to, uh, how to call it, wanting to run down to deep learning and neural networks when they can solve the problem by with an SCVM or a sim simple logistic regression. Uh, approach. So always try the simple one first. Run a couple of simple ones and see what you get. If you're happy with what you, your, your results, just, just go ahead. Because they, even, they also save you time. It's difficult to train the deep learning models, although they may do better, but it's difficult to train them. Okay. All right. One last question from Karim. Which one to choose if you have several classification methods that are applicable to the data? So this is answered, I suppose. Karen. Yeah. All right. So let's proceed. Any other questions from the audience here? Yeah. Yes. Yes, it's not about the cancer. What is what is it called? Ah, cancer. You don't know cancer? It's a kind of a disease. Oh, okay, the cancer disease. Yes, yeah, a cancer disease. So it's a kind of a disease which is like like this this generation of cells in your body. Okay. No, no, it's cancer. Normally, you have these images, and in first place, where uh, that I saw earlier, you have the image of breast cancer. You know, they scan them under these machines, and doctors look at them to say whether the patients have the cancer or they don't have the cancer. So the idea is, how do you automate this using a machine AI algorithm instead of a doctor looking at it? Okay. All right. Let's move on then. So reinforcement learning. What's the next topic? Just alert me, Malik, if somebody put something on the chat. Okay. So again, I have mentioned reinforcement learning as being this system of trying to mimic how we learn as humans, you know, 
Uh, it is where we study how animals and artificial systems can learn to optimize their behavior in the face of rewards and punishment. Okay. So it's not supervised learning because you don't have label data, right? It's not supervised learning. You don't have label data. It's rewards instead. Okay. Uh, it's not unsupervised learning because you give it some more guidance, right? Because you give these rewards, it's able to guide the agent to achieve your, your target, okay? So it's that's the main difference between reinforcement learning and unsupervised learning, okay? So it's, it uses ideas from a, a range of areas in science. And an example is, uh, I gave this AlphaGo, but in a lot of games, the idea of learning best strategy to win a game, this is usually uh, have been achieved more successfully with human learning than your other approaches. Okay. But again, autonomous navigation is one example. Um, even trading strategies, and people trading in the stock market, for instance, a lot of them are using a lot of uh, reinforcement learning now. Okay. Actually, people are trying to use it to learn how to fly a helicopter. Interesting. All right. So the topic was data science and deep learning. So all I've, I've been talking about is data science almost, is artificial intelligence, machine learning, all of that is data science. Actually, deep learning is data science, but we just wanted to focus on that a bit, okay? So deep learning, it could be used for all the tasks I mentioned earlier. It could be used supervised learning, unsupervised learning, um, reinforcement learning, and all. So we have deep reinforcement learning, which is also a form of deep learning. So it's not it's not a new area of its own, okay? But it's in, it's interesting because when we're talking about when we talk about the success of data science today, you know, or artificial intelligence today, it's because of deep learning, okay? So it's it's good that we we talk about it a bit more, okay? This is inspired by the neural system, the neural networks of brains, okay? So the backbone of these deep learning algorithms are neural networks, okay? They are neural networks. They are they are built to mimic how our brain is connected. But I think in a very layman way, it's, it's actually, you know, if you show this to a, a neuroscientist there, they would laugh at you, you know, this is definitely not true. Our neurons are not connected that way. But the idea, you would see what, why the idea is, is coming from there. Want to say something, Mali? Can you speak up or you can use the microphone? I'm not hearing you. So what you think about this? And also we can uh and then to your capability that you go to the information in the brain. So yes, so like I said, uh, AI now is being applied everywhere. So the idea of AI being inspired by neuroscience is true, but also the application of AI in neuroscience, like you said, it's also, it's a lot of, in fact, just two weeks ago, I was in this talk where somebody was trying to, you know, they're trying to actually, it was up to, before that, there was a lot of work in neuroscience trying to map different parts of the brain and their functions. Now they're using AI algorithms to try to do this more efficiently. So I wouldn't be surprised that they are able to use this. You know, psychology neuroscientists know how to like they could they could read parts of the brain. You know, like, I, I don't know if you know about Stephen Hawkins. People know about Stephen Hawkins, the great physicist. So it was a machine that was connected to his brain. He was not able to talk. So when he's talking, this is read read out by the computer. Okay. So they know the parts of the brain that talk. They know the parts of the brain responsible for thinking, what you are thinking and all that should be able to, yeah, at some point in the future, they should be able to figure out what you're thinking. I'm not sure how that successful would be, but speech is different, you know. As you're speaking, there's uh, some parts of the brain that is moving or maybe some, some, some firing in a particular way that they can interpret as speech, okay? But yeah, there are a lot of, a lot of interesting stuff that people are working on, you know. Okay, great. So, but this is coming from a different angle. Here is um, what happens is our brain is composed of these small, small neurons where they are all interconnected. So each neuron has dendrites 
where other neurons are connected. You know, so other neurons send signals through to another neuron through these dendrites. So all this information is processed in the nucleus of this uh, of the dendron of the of the uh, of the neuron, and then the neuron would decide to send sig the signal a signal further to other neurons using its connections, uh, uh, these axons, terminal. But what they figured out is that actually these neurons receive a lot of signals from different other neurons. It is not that whenever a signal comes, it would pass it on, no. So there is some kind of a threshold that it, 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 it decides on. Based on that threshold, it would decide to pass on a signal or not pass a signal. And passing the signal forward is what we call firing, okay? A neuron would fire or not fire, okay? When a neuron fires, it sends a signal that goes to other neurons that it is connected to, okay? So mathematically, this is what people try to model in the 40s. And I was telling you, in the 1940s, people talked about this. So there was a paper by Malloch and Pitts uh, in, the 19, in 1943 that tried to model the neuron. So you represent these dendrites by these edges. And the other neurons that are sending signals to these dendrites uh, would be these ones here. And the nucleus of the neuron would be this one there. And then, or maybe more, more precisely, the combination of these two, when it reaches a particular threshold, like you can think of this as a threshold function, if it reaches a particular threshold, then an output is sent, okay? That is the firing, okay? So people were trying to model this in the 1940s, okay? So this is the artificial neuron. It's called a perceptron, okay? They called it a perceptron in those days. So the idea is that those weights would decide whether the neuron the neurons are sending signals to the next neuron. When the weight is zero, there is no signal going. When it's when it's not zero, then the signal is passed on. Okay. So actually, neural networks uh, are like building maps that are non-linear. You know, we talked about this linear map, this map that we learn that maps our inputs to our outputs, right? You know, when you do linear regression, definitely the, the linear, that's where the name comes from, okay? This map is a linear function, okay? When we do neural networks, this map is no longer linear, okay? So this is why you can think about it as a non-linear problem, okay? The map we are building is a non-linear map, and again, it can be used to do uh, classification or regression, okay? It doesn't matter. But the, the only difference is that you are building a non-linear map in a particular way, and we will see how you build it. So essentially what you do, if you think about classification as building, if you think about these data points uh, living in space with these images of, of cancer and non-cancer press, for instance, living in space, you, cover, you can think about them as these green points and blue points, okay? All you need is to find a plane in space that will separate them, okay? And this plane is it's actually the linear separator, okay? The linear separator that would then separate them. So any points that lie on this side, you would consider as a green point, which might be the cancerous uh, points, or it could be uh, the non-cancerous point if it's blue, okay? So this is a linear separator. But the data may be, not be linearly separable. It could be in this form, for instance, in the second plot, right? You have these blue points in the middle, but you have these green points spread all over the place. So if you look at it, you can see that, oh, probably a circle would, have, would be a better separator here. In the inner one, those inside the circle would be the cancerous points or, or the blue points in this case. You can decide whether you want to call them the cancerous or non-cancerous. And the other class would be outside, okay? So you can use neural networks to do the second one, okay? While you cannot use a linear separator to do that. Of course, that's not quite true. What you could want to do, what, what you could do is if you dig deep a bit, people have worked on it also is, well, you know, we know like uh, uh, algorithms like support vector machines build linear separators. What you could do, you do um, some kind of lifting of the space. You know, you, 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 you there, there's something called kernel supervised methods or kernel SVM, where you try to map this space into another space where these points are linearly separable. But that's more advanced. We're not going to talk about it today. But anyway, the linear, uh, the, the neural networks help us build these nonlinear uh, uh, separators or nonlinear um, uh, boundaries, okay, of, of our classes. 
if you hear from uh, what uh, uh, Anis talked about, where initially when they were doing um, the, lab, the, the, the identification of disease in the cassava leaves, they have to look at the features and label them, right? Tag them on the leaf and then label those features, right? That's the way traditional uh, machine learning or statistical learning was done, okay, in those days. Based, you have to you have to generate the features yourself. But the good thing about deep learning or on the neural networks is no, there is no this feature generation. So you miss this feature extraction step. You don't need any feature extraction. But traditionally, these linear models would require you to do a feature extraction where you take the input, for instance, here's a good example. You have a car. What makes a car a car different from a human being? Okay. You look at it, it must have four wheels, for instance. It must have a windscreen. It must have windows, wind, glass windows, you know, and all this stuff. These are the little features that you put together to be able to classify a car as a car and something else that is not a car, right? So these are the features that you extract, okay? In, in deep learning, you don't want to do this, okay? So you, you combine the feature extraction step and the classification step together and put it in this deep learning model, okay, that you are building. Okay, that's the main difference between classical machine learning and deep learning. Okay, neural networks and deep learning. Until now, I'm using deep learning, but I haven't told you what deep learning is. But assume we are building a neural network. It's a network of neurons. That is uh, the algorithm that will do this classification for us. But we will know what it is in a moment. Okay. So as I mentioned, the one, the first um, example of a neural network. Try to, to, trying to model mathematically what the neuron is doing is, is the perceptron, okay? And then uh, uh, if you concatenate all these perceptrons together and connect them, they give, give us what is called an artificial neural network. And so it becomes a network, and it's a network that is artificial. It's not our natural network of neurons, right? So this is why it's called an artificial neural network, okay? Actually, instead of doing those weights like they are done, if you write those, put those weight multiplication in form of a convolutions, if you know about convolution from mathematics, if you do convolutions, then you have what is called a convolutional neural network. Okay? You could also talk about recurrent neural network where um, there are back connections, you know, there is information. So, for instance, if you are processing sequential data, like if you're predicting the weather, you, the weather today might depend on the weather yesterday or the weather day before, you know. So there might be some information from yesterday that you need that might be useful for today. So these back connections in your network is what is what leads to what is called a recurrent. So there's a recurrence relation. This needs a recurrent neural networks. They are autoencoders. They encode the data where they do some some kind of uh, how to call it uh, um, dimensional reduction. You have a, a data that lives in high dimensional space. You project it in a small space. And then you end, you, you you go back to the diamond like dimensional field. So this encoding there is a way of uh, reducing the dimension of your data. But that is what is called an auto encoder. Okay, that is called an auto encoder. There are generative adversarial networks where um, what you do is you want to build a network that can generate data for you. For instance, you want to build a network that is able to generate people's artificial faces of people. So you give it real images and it is trying to predict those images. You generate an image, you compare it to an image. So you have a, one network trying to fool the other network. It's like a game between two networks. And eventually, one of the networks, the one that is generating the image, becomes so good at doing it that the other one will not be able to detect whether this is a false image or a true image, OK? So this is why now, don't trust anything that you see online, OK? It's, you see, if they would see a photo of mine, it might not be me. It might be somebody else. So don't rush to make a judgment about somebody. There's a lot of fake news, and these tools are being used for that. Okay, so I thought I shouldn't bother you with the maths, but what is what was what is important here is if you think about those neurons that we are fi that we are connecting to uh, the, the the neuron uh, that we are interested in, you can think of it as data points. Okay, your x1, x2, x3, x4, these are data points. Okay, if for instance you are supposed to predict the price of a house. You may have, for instance, the location of the house. You know, houses in Fajara may be more expensive than houses in Basse, for instance. Okay, you might want to think about um, what is the size of, of, of the house. Okay, how many bedrooms are there? How many bathrooms are there? Okay, that information can be one information could be X, one data, 
like could be x0 the other could be x1 or x2 these are the, what what you give to your model based on the location based on the size based on the number of rooms based on the number of bathrooms this house might be more expensive than a similar house that is in base for instance okay um or based on that the price should be this you know if you are giving prices of different houses you know and you're predicting high prices based on that you could predict different house prices so you can input that data you can see that as a potential input as the neurons that are sending information okay so which one is more important in for the neuron to make a decision okay to say that the price should be this or the price should be the other that depends on weights that you are going to put on these edges okay and those weights are these theta's here that i put in this uh, scaring looking uh, mathematical expression the prediction that your your model will make which is what i call h theta here is a function of your input okay x is a vector it is composed of x0 to x3 uh, okay you give that to your model your model would learn this theta theta 1 theta 2 up to theta 4 in this case there are four so you multiply x0 by theta 0 x1 by theta 1 x2 by theta 2 x3 by theta 3 and then you get an output okay if it's a prediction of a price and then you see if you're happy with that output then you give that model to uh, your boss and say i think this should be the price of this house that we should sell it if you think it's not good you iterate you this is what is called the training now give it more houses and then go do a backward uh, like uh, back propagation try to improve the wet weights of your of your of your of your model okay but then this is this is this is an example of how you would uh, build a, a computational model a neural network okay a simple one is this one then you can add more and more let give a bit more detail of why is uh, this is different from the linear model so as 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 you multiply these weights by um by 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 these data points you then sum the results here okay you sum it if it's more than a particular number then you decide to fire remember that's what we said how it fires if it's more than a particular number it fires okay then that is modeled by some step function okay if it's more than a particular number it fires so that is what i refer to as this sigma here okay you take a multiplication between your input x and your parameters theta this is you can write as an inner product theta transpose x here and then you pass it through this nonlinear function that would then decide if it is uh, one it would fire if it is zero it will not fire or it could be a continuous function above a particular particular number it would fire below a particular number it will not fire okay it will output one and below it will not output one okay so typically what happens is that the x0 is multiplied by uh, x, uh, theta 0 and theta 0 is usually referred to as the bias okay and all the other weights are referred to as weights so combining the weights and the bias are called parameters so this is why we use theta to represent parameters but it's composed of b and w the w's are the weights which will be the blue black lines here and the b would be the blue line which uh, correspond to the weight on the blue line which would be the um the the, the, the bias okay it's called the bias okay yes there was a hand raise yes mandy you want to use the microphone okay. <laughs> Uh, from the previous uh, slide, I okay. see that we can apply a different method to both regression and classification problems. So I also want to know whether uh, when applying a uh, neural network to a data set, does it pass to be numerical data or uh, categorical, uh, categorical data or both? Very interesting. Um, yes, neural networks change the game, of course. I remember I mentioned earlier uh, classical machine learning algorithms, you have to encode everything, right? If it, it has to be numbers, otherwise it's not going to work. Okay? Actually, this still happens, but you don't have to do it as uh, the one who is building the model. Okay? Like uh, X, 
languages. So I could run NLP, you can input text. But we all know that text also is represented by numerical figures on the computer, right? So everything has to be complete. To be able to do computations, it has to be numerical. But um, now you can input text, actually, which with these models, you, just, you, you can input text, you can include audio, you can include images directly to your model. There is an interface that would convert this for you. You don't have to worry about that. Yeah. 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 Somebody's asking. Uh, you uh, recently mentioned um, rape and biases um, for data points, right? So um, I understand that rape and bias enables um, metaphysics and some generalization. Okay, so what I just understand is um, how do you handle this um, at each node? At each node, how do you determine this is the way that you are going to use? Um, but, but, but particularly, uh, the, the good question. Thank you very much. Very good question. And this is what it's trading is about. Trading the model is about finding the best ways. Okay, the best way to determine um, which uh, the model is going to be give the model best performance either in predicting the classes, right classes, or doing a regression program, okay? And so I deliberately did not discuss how the training is done, but I can explain it a bit. What happens is that when you, initially you start with random weights, just give it any number you want, okay? Um, again, for numerical stability, you can choose the numbers for your weights to be small, because when they are too light, you can have numerical uh, accuracy issues okay so choose the numbers very small let's say from minus one to one okay randomly pick numbers from there and use that as your weight and then predict compute your this h function like which is what you take you multiply each weight and bias to the corresponding input value of your axis and then sum all that total and then decide on this sigma function i haven't mentioned the sigma function you can see this is my next slide okay pick a nice big sigma function Okay, apply it, it will give you, a, give you a value. Compare that value to the y value, okay? If it was predicting a class and the y value class was one, and this number that your h function comes out with is 0 0.9, you maybe say, okay, this is fine for me. Okay, this is very close to one, I'm, I'm happy with that. But if you are not happy, how do you do this? It becomes an optimization problem. You define a loss function, okay? And then you minimize that loss function. And one of the popular ways of minimizing that loss function is using what is called gradient descent, okay? And the gradient descent algorithm is just that, what is your current point of which is, the, what are the current value of your weights, okay? The next value of your weights would be the current value minus a step size times the gradient at those, at those, at those uh, value of your weights, okay? So, Therefore, all you want to do is you differentiate your loss function and compute the value of the loss function using those numbers that you, those weights that you use to compute the loss. You get this now. Then the learning rate also is tuned, uh, is, is, is a tuned parameter. We call it a hyperparameter. You could usually take it to be very small. You could change it as you are iterating. You know, if you put in applied maths, you notice know, this is like a step side selection. There's, uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, heuristics of how you can do this. There is no correct or wrong answer. You try based on your data what is correct. But then that's how you do it. Then you hope that when you choose a learning rate and you are you, sub, you multiply that to the value of your gradient, you subtract this from your current weights. These new weights now, you go back and multiply that to your data again. Okay? These new weights and bias multiply to your data. And then, and then aggregate and see and, and pass it through your this sigma function and then see what you get. You may get now uh, 0 0.95, for instance. You're getting close to one. You are not at one still. Then you can say, I'm still, I'm not happy with this. <clears throat> you go back again, do the same trick. You know, this new weights becomes your old weights. You want to generate new weights based on your old weights. You again multi subtract a little step size multiplied by the value of your gradient. Okay? And then you go back and multiply those new weights to your data and aggregate 
pass it through the signal function, what does this give you? 0 0.98. So this is the training. So training is about doing this. This iteration back and forth is how you train the neural network. Okay? All this because it's the nature of gradient descent, you know. Um, ideally, you know, if you write the algorithm, the, the, the optimization problem, you should find a closed form solution, uh, which is usually not possible for this, this type of networks. I hope that answered your question. So in the next slide, I talk about what kind of function. You remember, you want you want a step function to say the neural network will not fire, the neuron will not fire until a certain threshold is reached, then it would fire. Okay. This is like a step function in mathematics. We know that. Okay. But I just I just mentioned to you that we need to differentiate. These step functions are not differentiable, right? So this is a problem. So people come up with functions that are close to a step function that are differentiable. Okay, and we know them, some of them are popular, like the sigmoid function. This is one over one plus exponential of minus x. Okay, this looks like a step function you can see, right? It's not quite a step function, but it's smooth and continuous and it's differentiable. Okay, so it's an if it's, it's a proxy for a step function. We have the tangent hyperbolic, tangent, the hyperbolic tangent function, okay, which is also like this, it's a step function. And then people come up with the rectifier linear unit which is zero for negative values and it takes different values uh, for positive values okay so this is the relu function these are just few examples of this function that we would nonlinear function that we have to pass our aggregation through right? when we aggregate we pass it through this nonlinear function and these are three examples and this nonlinear function have a specific name it's called the activation function okay it's the activation function we have linear models before neural networks, but neural networks are unique because of these activation functions. And it has been rigorously proved mathematically that if you have a three-layer neural network with the correct activation functions, then you are able to approximate any function, okay? The model you build will be very good for approximating any function, okay? I wanted to uh, talk a bit about the artificial neural network, just also just terminology, okay? But I have exhausted almost everything. So you remember the, the, the perceptron, you have one neuron, let's say this top blue one, and it's connected to X1, X2, X3. Now what you do is you, con you connect it to more neurons. So neurons are, are arranged in layers, okay? You connect it to more neurons, okay? Before you have your H, okay? So this is a, um, um, uh, a, 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 a three-layer neural network. Three-layer, usually we, we don't count either the last layer or the, the end layer, okay? So we call it three-layer, but in a sense, if you count, you should, if you count the data, the input one, then you would have four layers, okay? So we, disc, we don't count the input layer, we count all this layer. The next layers, we have a three-layer neural network. But in essence, when you look at the ar architecture, the data input layer one, and this is layer two, layer three, layer four, and layer four is here is our output layer, okay? And we can have more and more layers. This is where the name deep comes from, okay? Okay, the models we build are, are many, many layers, millions of layers, actually, all right? We don't design them by hand, and we train them. Some of these models are trained in, for months. They're running, in one, they're running one computation for one month. Okay, and this is a gigantic, huge computer or string of computers that is running this. So they're very, very huge models. Okay, this is why they are called deep. Uh, and because of that, we say deep learning. Okay, it's machine learning with deep models, with deep neural networks. Okay, so the more layers we have, the deeper it is. Actually, there's a term that is not famously used, which is the width. People in, in the theory are side of things are interested in this. Because the question is, how many layers do I need to be able to perform a particular task? Or how many neurons do I need to stack in a layer to be able to uh, perform a particular task? You remember I mentioned about the step size that we need to choose. So the step size, the number of layers, the number of neurons in a the layer, these are hyperparameters. And hyperparameters are like no correct answer kind of problems, okay? They are trial and error based, you tune tuning methods, you know, you try one thing, it works, you're happy with it, you go with it, somebody tries something else, it works, they are happy with it, you know, and you know, people suggest heuristics, 
uh, of ways of doing things, but generally these are fine tuned. Okay, these are hyperparameters that the modeler has to de determine. Okay, this is not part of uh, the training. Okay, you design, you determine from this on go. I want to try this. Sometimes you try, it doesn't work. You increase the number of layers. You try. You do increase. You try. You increase. You know. You realize maybe it's not the number of layers. I must increase the number of um, neurons. You know, you increase number of neurons per layer, you run, you are happy, then you take that. Or you may not be happy, you do some, some other thing. So you have to fine tune these things, okay? So they are called hyperparameters. I like one thing that came up in the talks earlier, something called transfer learning. The idea is that people have built very successful models in doing a lot of stuff, stuff, stuff like VGC 16, for instance, Inception 3, you know, uh, Dina mentioned this, I think, uh, I'm not sure uh, Anis mentioned it. Different kinds of models that people build. ResNet is there. People build them and it takes a long time to train them. And they are very they are they are very good at doing the tasks they were set to do. All right. VGG3, VGG16 was classifying images from the ImageNet data set. If you know about ImageNet data set, if you don't know, Google it up. This was actually one of the data sets that led to the new revolution in deep learning. So the ImageNet data set, that was that was what VGG16 was training. If you want to do classification of images in breast cancer, for instance, you wouldn't find breast cancer images on the image set, uh, image net data set. And the image net data set has thousands of categories. Here you're interested in only two categories. Okay. So if you want to take VGD and use it for, for breast cancer, it wouldn't work. What you do is you cut the last layer and replace it with two neurons. Okay. A layer of two neurons. Because your problem is classifying only two, two, two classes. Cancer or no cancer, right? And what you want to do then is the question is because the model here is about the weights, the parameters that correspond to different edges. That's that's what the model is. You so luckily all these models are saved uh, in 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 whatever format. In GitHub you can find them in GitHub, or you can I think in terms of some of them now are, are automatically given in in terms of flow or PyTorch. You can just download the model yourself. And then you can do the streaming that I said, add a new layer, remove the last layer, add your own new layer. And then what you want to do is what people have shown that if you directly use the weights that came from ImageNet, it wouldn't do well. So what you do is you want to choose some layers. Let's say the last 10 layers or the last few layers, you retrain those. What, how, what does the retraining mean? The last thousand layers, keep those, keep those weights as they are, okay? Then take these last uh, layers, last three layers, change those, keep changing those weights. Do your back propagation only on those weights, okay? Do that a couple of times, you would realize that you have built a new model that is based on somebody's uh, architecture they built for their own problem, but it's gonna work for your problem. So you don't have to worry about how many layers I have to build, how many neurons I have to build. So there are ready-made uh, architectures that you can download and use, which is, and then do transfer learning. Okay? You transfer the knowledge from one model to your model. Okay, that's the whole point of transfer learning. Questions? Yeah. <laughs> the data size. No. Again, like I said, um, this is. Uh, it's still not clear what is the determining factor for this. You know, people use different layers. You know, you say, if somebody say I use 152 layers and they work, and somebody would argue, why don't you use 155? Is it going to be better? They have we should probably tried 155 and they realize that it's not doing better than 152. So they stopped at 152, for instance. Maybe if somebody pick randomly add an extra 100 layers than do 252, it may do better. But people don't have infinite time to do all the tests, right? Something works, they just use it. Yeah. So it doesn't depend on the data now. Yes. Are you referring to transfer learning? Drop off. So this is a more advanced concept. So what has been discovered is that sometimes these uh, uh, models overfit your data, okay? You want them, I think uh, Anis also mentioned this, you want to build models that are robust so that, you know, you give them a data point. So 
somebody also mentioned here about generalization. Was you right? So this is this is the key about building models, because what happens is you want your model to go out there and do well on data it has not been trained on. Okay, you learn this is a bottle, and what is hoped that if you go to Passe and somebody give you a bottle, you would still be able to say this is a bottle. Okay, so the idea of of, of learning is to be able to apply what we learn outside, and this is what generalization is about. Okay, you build a model on a particular finite set of data. The idea is that if the doctor is going to use that, for instance, to be able to scan breast cancer, obviously the images that this model is going to work on, which is what is called deployment, the images that you're going to deploy this algorithm on would not be the images that it is trained on, okay? So you want it to, to, to have the same performance or comparable performance to the performance it had when you trained it on images that it has not seen. This is called good generalization. If it doesn't perform well, then we say it is poor, poor generalization, okay? It generalizes poorly. So people want to build models that are robust, that generalize very well, okay? Because the idea is that you can deploy them and expect that they would work on data they have not seen before, okay? So one way to, to, to improve the generalization of our, uh, our, our models is that we we reduce overfitting. What overfitting means is the model would learn everything about the data set that you have given it. Too much, it can, it might be able to predict exactly everything about your data. Because, and, but then it would do very poorly the moment you give it data that is not part of that data set. Because what it, the function is in such a way that it is able to map uh, the inputs and the labels perfectly. And that data point that you have may not lie exactly on one of those data points. Therefore, it was not able to, it's not able to map it properly, okay? So to avoid this overfitting is, sometimes you take a model that is making some mistakes in your data, it's making some error, but then still it would give a better performance on data it, it has not seen before, okay? And to do this, one of the things is dropout. What you do, what you see is, in this, uh, this is actually what is going to be in the next slide, you have this, this networks, the way they are connected. Almost every neuron is connected to every neuron, right? You can see every neuron in one layer connected to the neurons in the next layer. The same, all neurons in one layer are connected to the other neuron, and so on. These are what we call feed forward neural network and fully connected. Okay, As you will see this term when people talk about fully connected neural network. This is what they mean. And it is discovered that this full connection leads to overfitting. So, what you do is you disconnect some of the edges. And one way to do this is drop out, like he said, you just choose a neuron and then disconnect all the edges that connect to that neuron. So you drop that neuron out. So it's called drop out. Okay. It solves that kind of overfitting problem. But uh, it's a more advanced topic. We don't want to go more into detail into that. Okay. So this is an example of having these many, many layers and all of them are over interconnected that way. Okay. I'm going to spare you all that. Do we have a break? I think it's uh, we've been going on for long questions and a break and see. Maybe have some coffee, if people want coffee. I think it's been going for a while. No, no, just ask your question. Huh? Yeah. Okay, um, my question is about uh, artificial intelligence more about computer. Yeah, right. You put down a system for question and dimension. You can do that by classification for the data and the data. So you can use it in the system for some time. Mm. Um, later you realize that there is an error class classification. Are you going back to the current system or is there any mechanism for the problem? Excellent question. Excellent question. And this is what um, regulators are grappling with actually, you know. Um, but I think uh, it is normal. Because even if people make instruments for operation in a theater, for instance, they go through many, many tests. Okay, and you know some of the instruments you have to calibrate them right regularly. So I think machine learning algorithms also will have to go on uh, that. So there are two two ways. One is um, the model, um, the data might be changing. The model, the data it was trained on, this new data might be completely different as as time is evolving. So the model might be changing, the data might be changing. And because of that, the model will start doing poorly. Okay. The other thing is, it's just that the, 
Stop. <laughs> my slides are moving. Salim, are you moving my slides? Okay. So that is very important. And yeah, one of the ways that, uh, one of the solutions that is being proposed to regulators is to say, if people develop an AI algorithm or an AI application, um, there should be regular uh, calibrations where they can go and retrain it. For instance, after some time, they think that the data has changed significantly enough, they should retrain their models and re update their models, yes. And I don't think since this is complicated, Microsoft asks us to update every time, right? This is very similar. They will retrain the model, and all of a sudden, you, you want the command login, start the instrument, it says you it needs to update, and then you just update it again, you know, and it will upload new model parameters, yes, yes. That's, that's, I think that's what's, what's going to happen, yes. Go ahead, go ahead. I use the microphone. <laughs> Um, with regards to this question that I was talking about, right? Yes. This is his question, right? It depends. And like I said, if the model is doing well and is continuously doing well, if the model is doing well and is continuously doing well, you don't have to do it frequently. But like I said, you should have ways of mechanisms of measuring how how your model is doing over time. And there might be like a yeah, regulators must be involved. There might be some error that they have been monitoring. If your model reaches this error, they would have to say, look, you have to retrain your model or you withdraw it from the system because it's no longer valid or it's no longer, uh, we cannot uh, guarantee it's, it's output. Okay? But this is, this is way in advance when you have developed this model, it has gone through all kinds of tests and is accepted by the medical board. There's a medical board that must decide whether you can use it if it's for medicine, for instance, you know, and it's been deployed to do this, then yes. Uh, and again, like I said, this is very early stage. Everything is, you know, even in the advanced advanced countries. You know, I was in a conference about two weeks, two weeks ago, in medical imaging, they are working on laws to govern this, you know. The FDA in the US, which is the agency responsible for licensing any product, is setting up committees from AI experts and medical uh, practitioners to help them come up with regulations for this. Yes. Yeah. And there are people, PGTCs, people working on how to work on this, solve this problem. Actually. Yeah. Very interesting research area. So there's research for humanities people in machine learning, like even law people, if you want to work on ethics and AI and how machine learning, there are problems you can work on, like this. Okay, there are some questions on online. Okay, this I saw already. How to determine the XO variable that will be associated to your bias? Ah, okay. Typically, we just set it set that to one, okay? The X0 we set to one. Okay, so it's just the B that you worry about. X0 is one. And then there was another question by Salio. The ideas drawn from Dina, Anis, and Bubakar are super tough to inspire us to think more and make real the learning through innovation and inventions for social societal good. Idealism does equate with realism. Thank you all. Okay. I wanted to just reiterate um, uh, some of the opportunities um, that this uh, new area or new success in this area, of course, I said it's not new because people have been, I have these ideas from a long time ago, but its successful implementation is recent and it has presented a lot of opportunities, okay? And so I give, I list a couple of them. One of them is, uh, um, the research community, this is interesting to them, is that data is no longer the bottleneck. We have a lot of data with this new era of, of big data, and we can, we can build these models. And I just had yeah, a couple of examples of where you can find data. If you are a bioinformatician and you're in, interested in genomic data, there's a lot of publicly available data at EBI. This is the European Bioinformatics Institute. Um, but uh, if you just an uh, amateur, you want to try some data sets on machine learning, uh, Google this UCI dataset repository. There's a lot of data sets there that you can download.
and play with. Uh, also, Google built something very similar to this UCI repository, Google data sets. It's like cool search, but uh, you know, it's, it helps, it's very efficient in searching for data sets. You know, Kaggle data sets also is coming up, yes? Yeah, yeah they are reliable data sets, well curated data sets that you can use to train your model. So it's actually good if you are training, retraining a model. Like I said, give I give an example. You went to a company and you wanna predict house house prediction, uh, predict some house prices, and you realize the company doesn't have enough data. You know, maybe thousand data points, for instance, or less than a thousand data. There is a free, uh, publicly available online data set on house prices. You can download it and start building a model on that, and then later retrain that model on your company data, for instance. You know. So that's one strategy. Okay. Kaggle, Kaggle is not only a data set provider. Kaggle is a competition platform. From once once in a while, they 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 put uh, um, <clears throat> they put up a challenge where uh, 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 they want people to build models. They would give you the data set. You download the data set, build your model, upload your model, and test it on their data. They would have a data a training data set and a testing data set. Usually they don't give you the test data set, they keep that. When you finish training your model, you you, get, you upload your model on their platform, they test it and you, it gives you a score. You can test it yourself and it gives you a score. And usually it's a, a window is given, let's say, uh, on the, until the end of the month, that year of June, they would look at it. There's a leaderboard, the one with the highest score of performance uh, would be would be given some kind of a prize. You know, usually maybe one, not one or the top five, or the top 10 are given a price, okay? So it's also a challenge where you can start building your data science skills, okay? You can try Kaggle. You have access to data sets, but you can also try. Even if you look at all the, uh, all the challenges, it would just start to build your model and compare to what is in the leaderboard. They still have the leaderboard for all the challenges you can find there, okay? So you can compare your results to them. You can still upload. Most of them are still active. You can upload your model and see how well you do, and you compare to what is in the leaderboard, okay? All right, so computing resources are in high uh, um, abundance nowadays, you know. Um, um, unfortunately, uh, not as much as we would love in Africa. Um, I think in the Gambia, we only have one high performance computing facility, which is at MRC currently. And I guess uh, the minister has got the minister of Sendezi are gone, but we would have said, uh, we would request that they try to build. Uh, at least a national one. One thing in South Africa is they have national computing, high performance computing facility that researchers in different universities can submit run simulations on. And I think we need something like that in this country. Okay. But apart from that, there is cloud services. You can run things on Google Colab, for instance, to give you certain uh, number of compute hours. The only problem is for Google Colab, you need to have. Uh, you have, need to be connected on the internet. There are other um, um, platforms where you can submit the job and then disconnect. This is why these are like these, these standalone hack of computing facilities. I was talking to Hydra, this is something I forgot to mention. One thing we could uh, try to do is to get uh, UTG students able to run simulations on the MRC facility. In that case, what you do is just log in, you create an account for you, log in, run the job, submit a job, and log off. And anytime the job is ready, you, you you have a notification. You can download the results of the computation. Okay, so this is this is this is also possible. All right, this was example of a successful data science project. Um, uh, this guy is at uh, I think it was Stanford um, um, discovered this uh, uh, one a, a, a new gene for diabetes which was not known until they did this experiment. They just ran um, some, they wanted to discover patterns. There was some unsupervised learning kind of thing, discover patterns in the data that they had. And they realized a relationship, a strong relation, correlation between this gene and that, uh, this type two diabetes, you know? And this prompted a discussion between the team leader and some people in, in, in uh, doing, in the, in the medical field that are doing research on on diabetes, and they run several experiments and uh, confirm what these guys, these guys found. So it is, you see these kinds of opportunities pop up. Um, an example of what opportunities was uh, what uh, Ernest and, uh, and, uh, and, and Dina showed earlier, okay? So he was the uh, 
the head of that group, Atul, Atul, and he was he made this public famous public comment that says public is great, big data is great, but big uh, public big data is just awesome. Yeah. So they they I think they won a big prize for getting that. All right, that's uh, quickly. Um, there are a lot of challenges. Um, there are, of course, a lot of problems. Africa is almost like a barren land, of unexploited land. There's a lot of new problems that we can try these tools on, OK? Um, Gambia is, is, has a specificity that we have to work around. I'm just, I was imagining while Arnes was talking and Dino was talking, how easy would it be to replicate those kinds of experiments here? Would you have the cooperation of the, the, very, the, the poultry owners? How do you make them accept to, to do this? First of all, they will suspect that you are trying to make money out of their their, their chicken chicken feed pools or something like this. So they will want you to give them money, you know. So there's a whole uh, awareness thing that has to be done in this country, but also I think systems must be in place. Like right? they have very regular, well uh, trained vet experts that these people listen to. We should have that also here. Maybe we have it, but uh, maybe I'm not aware. So those things are. Uh, some of the challenges we face, but we should not shy away from the problem. We would try to engage the right authorities. Um, and like I said, um, we, one thing that was that I forgot to say actually was the launch. If you see on the schedule, there was a launch of what we call um, Gambia AI Network. So we hope that this group transforms to what we call the Gambia AI Network, and we become a big lobby group now to move ideas about AI in this country. Okay, so we would work with uh, government and the right authorities to see how to push this and create more projects for you guys to work on. But um, there are a lot of challenges, you know. Um, computationally, data is very high dimensional when you work in this area. Data, I talked about the big data problem, data being having a veracity and velocity. The heterogeneity data, of course, is not perfect. There's a lot of incomplete data. They tell you, for instance, MRC have a lot of data, but you go there, like they've been collecting data since the 1970s about certain diseases, but you would see that that data is not perfect. When you start looking at it, there are holes here and there, okay? So data is always incomplete, so you have to think about ways of handling incomplete data, okay? Also, how do we scale? Scale is a problem. This algorithm, this data is huge, and these algorithms are can be big. You cannot sometimes run some, some of them on your laptop, for instance. So you need, we need to find ways of doing that. And some of you who are in the business space, timeliness is important. You know, a client comes to you, they want a solution. You want to be able to provide that solution with a given time. You know, you can build the, the, the most efficient or the, the most accurate model. Um, but if it's going to take 20 years to finish uh, training that model, that would be a useless model, right? So there's a between there's a trade-off between uh, a good enough model and time. Okay. So your boss will always tell you this if you start working. You should have this at the back of your mind when you start working in industry. So those are challenges that you face. And then I'll just come back uh, to this challenge of generalization, uh, just formalize it for you. Um, there is work that uh, looked at uh, generalization, and they have discovered that if you are training a model, let's say in the horizontal axis, axis this is the train you're doing. This, you know, you know, is uh, this round that I mentioned to you, backward and forward, right? You call them, if you round one, do one round over all the data, it's called an epoch, okay? You repeat that, and another epoch. So more and more rounds you do, more epochs. So this is training epochs, more training you're doing, okay? What it turns out that this green line is supposed to represent your, your training loss, you know? The loss function, there's a lot of function you're trying to minimize. Ideally, you want it to go to zero. So it will be going down. Okay, as you uh, as you are training, as you're doing this epochs, what happens is that if you want to continue, if you continue infinitely in time, you might get to zero. But what is going to happen is you're going to be overfitting your data, and the chances that you will not that your model will not generalize well. And what has been shown is that actually, what you do is typically when you do training, you split your data because you don't know data that you are going to see after you deploy your model. You only have this data. You want to you want your model to work on data it has not seen. Okay, so therefore take your data, split some, and keep it aside. That when you finish build training your model, you want to test your model on this data. Okay, so this is why we say you split your data into training and testing. Okay, 
But even the training data, you can split further into training and validation. That because then when you are training, at any time you do one epoch round the data, take that model, test it on your validation set and see how, how well it's doing. Okay? And then record a point on your prediction error. Okay? Then do another epoch, record another point. As you're doing epochs, you're recording point, you would see that initially your, both your error at your validation and your training would be very high, but they would start decreasing. They may not decrease at the same rate. Typically, your validation error will be higher, always higher than your training error, okay? But your validation error will stop reducing at some point. It will start going on. This is the point where you're starting overfitting, okay? So if, if you are monitoring this, and what you do in, in practice is you always are saving your best model. Anytime you take an error, you, mod, you, take, you do a validation, you have an error, you see if your previous model has a better error, a smaller error, you keep that one, you don't change. If um, the new one is better, you save these new weights, okay? And then you do that. So always you keep your best model as you go on, okay? If you get to this point where the models you are getting are always giving you higher error, you go back to that best model that you have, which will typically be at this stopping point here. And you use that. This model is guaranteed to generalize more than any model that you do afterwards that may even have a smaller training error, okay? So that's how you do it. Again, you can look at this in terms of over-parameterization. What is over-parameterization? You're having more parameters than your data points, okay? The parameters, remember, are these weights on your edges, right? So the more layers you have and more neurons, the more parameters you have. Typically, we build these gigantic models that have more weights than parameters. So we, we are in this regime that is called an over-parameterization regime. And typically in mathematics, if you look at, think about results from approximation theory, this is always gonna give an overfitting problem. But why this is not happening? And people have looked at this. Actually, if you look at new papers, they actually they call it double, double descent. It's not just one descent. Once this validation error goes up, it turns out you can build a plot like this where you, on the, on the horizontal axis, you have your over-parameterization. The more you add parameters, you see that the more your training error goes down, but your validation error will first go down and then start going up, shoot up. But if you continue adding parameters, it will further go down in some point. So they call it the double dip, okay? And this is because over-parameterization may not necessarily lead to overfitting, okay? So over-parameterization is uh, another challenge. Then one last, oh no, no, I think I have one more point. One last point is privacy concern. And this is why I mentioned lawyers should come in. You know, we all are concerned about our privacy. We don't want our private stuff to be exposed to other people, especially health issues. You know, this is why we have doctor-patient confidentiality. So when we are training this model, we don't want to expose people to private data. How do we do this? You know, these are challenges people are working on. You, you want to incorporate this into the models or do you want to have legislation, you know, that forces people when they build models that force they have to uh, de-identify the data, anonymize the data, you know, so that you remove all information about the patient data, their name, their location, their all, all the other things, you know, that would lead people to identify these patients, you know. It's not all usually straightforward, but this is always encouraged. This is a matter of most in most institutions, okay? So there is work there on helping how to build models that would incorporate this, or how to build laws that would force people to increase. Okay, so people who are in the humanities and legal side of things have a lot of work. Mr. Hydra, Dr. Hydra just told me, in fact, they have just constituted the ethics committee at the UTG here. So this is one of the things they might be interested in working on, data privacy, yeah. All right, so one last slide. This is about <clears throat> explainability. One thing is, uh, you see this deep model, this is like, layers and weights, you know, you know, have one model that will have thousands or millions of parameters, okay? This is not helpful to the doctor, or even it's not helpful to the banker. So banks would use, for instance, your data and determine whether they should give you a loan. You get to the bank, you apply for a loan, they input their, your data into their algorithm, and the algorithm says, no, don't give this guy a loan. And then you, the a banking agent calls you and tells you, no, we are refusing your loan. And you ask, what is the reason? You say, no, our algorithm says we shouldn't give you a loan. You are not satisfied, right? You want them to explain why. So 
people are not happy that most of these algorithms are like black boxes, okay? You give it input and it gives you output, but you don't know how it got to that output, okay? So that is a black box. So this is a big question about explainability. And it turned out, actually, there's a graph, a cartoonist representation where you can see the models that do very well in terms of accuracy are less explainable, like these deep models we're talking about. They have less explainability. You cannot relate what these weights and activation functions are in terms of, okay, maybe somebody has a low income, that's why he was rejected for the loan, or maybe they don't have an, an, a job right now, this is why they have been rejected for, for a loan. So you would want models that are explainable that would pick out some of these things, and then would, the agent would sit down in front of you and say, oh, no, no we, look, we look, at your, look at your income. Your income is low for this loan that you have applied. Maybe you should reduce the amount you applied for, or your history in terms of credit score. You, uh, Anis mentioned this, it's credit scoring. Your history about paying loans is, is poor. So you go to the West, credit scoring is very important because banks use that to determine whether they give you a loan or not, okay? And this is based on your history of paying back loans. Okay, so they give you a credit number to say this ban is credible or this woman is credible or non-credible. Okay, so the banker should be able to explain to you and say, oh, your credit score is very low, so therefore we cannot give you a loan. So we want models that can do that, can give you explainable things. But unfortunately, this is not the case. There are a lot of tools now people are working on to make these models more explainable. You can use, for instance, a deep unexplainable model to build, to, to, to do a certain prediction. And what you do is, can you approximate this with a simple model, like a linear regression model, which would then help you identify uh, what are the key features that were choose. Or use um, a decision tree model, for instance, that would tell you which features were used to arrive to this decision, okay? So that will support explainability and, and support decision making, okay? So that is uh, it. From me, uh, I'll skip this practical consideration. We will do that another time. Any questions? Everybody hungry now? Let's just go have lunch, right? Okay. So we have lunch and we call it a day. And tomorrow we start our time. Uh, we start at nine. And tomorrow, serious business. We've got the computer lab, right? It's downstairs. So come in, prepare, remember, refine your coding skills tonight if you have to do something, you know. But you don't have to install anything on your computers, right? Everything is going to be, we're going to use the computers and the computer lab, yes. So just come in and, yeah, just delve in to it, right? So less talking and more doing now, okay? All right, it's been a long day. Let's retire, have lunch, and then leave. Thank you very much.